that you know, maybe us we to, can... uh, welcome to our next episode of Light Beer and Dark Money. And we are honored to have Congressman David Schweikert with us. Yeah. You're uh, just honored to have a guest show up, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, we haven't had one of this caliber yet. So, well, I know that's not true. I mean, we've had Robert, we've had Jeff. So, yeah, but, but, I mean, but, you know, have a congressman on. Yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. So thank you for being here. And then David's a great friend. You didn't friend. give me a choice. <laughs> and, and the crazy that, that, that thing. That is true. I've known both of you. You do realize how creepy this is. I've known both of you the majority of my life. Yeah. You since college and got your family, you know, interacting in the state with, you know, crossing paths with my family. I think my whole life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the story of how we we connected was oh, yeah. very that similar. Time in tent city when we were going through <laughs> rehab. Yeah, well, it's it's very similar to how uh, I connected with with uh, John Shattuck back in the day when when uh, Sean was his chief, and that was um, I remember being at uh, one of these these confabs, National Beer Wholesaler confabs. And you stopped me as we were leaving your office, and you told me a story about how my dad, your dad. gave you one of your first your, yep, I, political yep. donations. Yep. And I missed the, the next. I think the next two meetings because we just sat there in, the, in in between the doorway. I think. Well, and just chatted for another hour. But it does. Hour. You know, there's this running joke really that cool. Arizona, and particularly Phoenix, but even maybe more so Tucson, are like the biggest small towns. Mm-hmm. And, and and there's a certain fact to that because so many folks are new, you know, who've come here to to rebuild and change or have opportunity for their lives. But there's not that many of us who've spent most of our lives sort of involved, in, involved in, the, in in sort of the civil society of the community or government or those because the people who've moved here are trying to get their lives organized right. and take care of their families and other things. So you end up with this concentration. If you really step aside, there's only three, four, five hundred people that, if you really laid out their names, are involved in sort of everything because that's just been their history. They've been here. They've already taken care of getting their, their lives organized. So now they donate it to whether it be politics or the universities or, you know, the community at large. Yeah. Sorry, that was right. a long reason why I say that. No. no it's a, but it's a great point because um, – I mean, it, it is a, a a small town, and in the regard of the number of people who are the the doers, yeah, right. Um, we we just talk about it. No, I think, <laughs> we, do, I think we do some stuff, but um, what? So, I mean, things have been so different than my days on the hill. Obviously, it's gotten much more uh, divided. I, I prefer uh, the word vicious. Vicious. <laughs> Right, but talk, walk us through just the last few weeks. I mean, since you since the inauguration and all of the barriers, and I guess some of that's the fencing and stuff is coming down. But well, but but let's be cynical for a moment. There were rumors about two weeks ago that whether it be the D Triple C or one of the Nancy Pelosi's PAC or those things were out doing some focus groups and polling around the country. And, you know, um, uh, Washington is a gossipy town. And there were rumors that the fence wasn't polling well. And guess what happens? As soon as we leave in the middle of the night, um, at functioning at like one in, in the morning, the fence starts to come down. So and this is right after you left. Because right after of the we left. The, 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 they thought They'd, there might be a threat. No, no, was, no. The th- I still believe that was theater. Yeah. I mean, this was, it was a visual to reemphasize the Democrats of, you know, hey, don't pay attention to what's been happening in our cities all, all summer long. Focus on Washington. And as soon as they realized the public wasn't thrilled with the Democrat plan of you having a green zone for the Capitol, <laughs> um, the fence comes down. And I just use that as sort of a, a factual tree of how much of this was real and how much of this was sort of messaging. Um, I think a very dark message. Yeah. But once again, this is about power and control. And if you can control the narrative with things that are symbolic, you do it. And as soon as it stopped having it's a political value for the left, you know, a half a billion dollar fence comes down. Now, what, what about the National Guard and 
in that. Is that, that that's still staying. Oh, the though. poor guard. You, it was, it was you, poor guy. No, no. Are, are you I, taking I them coffee? Oh, actually, um, I have a coffee story, but that's a little later. Yeah. You, you'll, you'll have conversations with them, and they just stare at you like, why am I here? Yeah. They, they, they're, a couple of them will actually tell you they're just embarrassed that this is their assignment, but um, because they're being used um, as theater puppets. You know, it's just props, you, you've heard yeah. the term sock puppets for the internet, where you create fake accounts, you know, to try to make it seem like you know, you have momentum and a message. Um, these poor members of our National Guard are being used as um, theatrical performers um, in, a, in sort of a ornamental way for the Democrat message. Am what? I being cynical enough yet? Because yeah, that can get pretty much <laughs> darker if you understand. <laughs> Um, you know, I have very close relationships with uh, a couple of Democrats who are on ways and means with me. They're smart. They're good people. They're liberal, but they're not crazy. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, a, that's a big distinction. And they will tell you that their base has gone so far over the cliff that they're even scared to death to like have a photo taken with me. I mean, it, it, it shows you when you're terrified of the troll armies on the internet, you, you start to understand we've lost our minds. Well, and I think that that's a I, that's a really important point because I think to the average American, they look at this division and they they just don't understand why is this happening. And and the underlying fact is that the Republican base has gone so far, you know, Trumpian. And and the left has gone so far, you know, socialism, that you know, there's just the division of the bases is what's driving the members, right? It, it's, I think it partially is. No, no, it absolutely is. Um, I, I will make you the argument that the Republican activists and base are a bit more broad, and some are have some have become populists, mm-hmm. you know, which is. Uh, a lot of them don't completely understand the economics that comes with populism of can often be very disruptive if it's not well thought out. Some are just f- truly fearful of government. And one of the things they loved about our last president is they felt they had someone talking to them. And we actually see that in some really interesting voting numbers on how much of the working class and even right. the, the the working poor, which is one that blows my mind, um, uh, some of the most Hispanic counties in the United States, the Republicans got tremendous cha- movement in the vote. Yet suburban women, often um, better educated, you know, financially much more comfortable, went the other direction. Is there a realignment where these folks over here say, finally, I have someone understanding how hard we're struggling just to be able to s- survive, make our payments. You know, God forbid we ever had enough money to start saving for the, our future. And other populations who are just angry because their feelings are not being addressed. And, and, I, I, and I'm, I know these are broad brushes, but when you do big boy polling like we did in this last election, you broke down those cross tabs. It was sort of shocking because you were seeing populations that. Like Democrat males, I was actually doing pretty well with. You know, I'm a fairly conservative, more libertarian sort of guy, and Democrat men. But I had a portion of Republican women who just hated all Republicans. So yeah. well, you, I you think figured it, that out. I, well, I, I, what what analysis I've looked at and what we've done internally in our shop shows that the 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 best indicator was education level. The more educated, the more you voted Democrat. Less educated, the more you voted Republican, which uh, is a complete paradigm but, shift. But, but, you got, but you had to be a little careful. Um, we did something simple, but we did two curves that crossed. We actually did an education curve and then an income curve, our house value curve. And we found also at a certain point the income broke. Yeah. And then they were Republican. And then they came back. You know, so yeah. the person with the PhD – that in, in you know, on social science, but they have a really high income. They they were Republican, 
Um, I'm well educated, but I work, you know, they, I have a sort of protected position in a business or government. They had gone left. Mm -hmm. What, um, now, you, you were, there was a lot of speculation that you were done, that you were not going to win your reelection. Um, you ended up winning fairly handily. You outperformed mm -hmm. Trump yeah. in your vote. Um, but you and I, let, let me jump on this. You and I had a conversation. We had polling, um, and, and I told you, it, it, you know, we're going to work hard. You know, we, we, we play fairly rough in our elections, but there was never math where we were upside down. And, and I think it's one of the problems we have in our political marketplace here, particularly in the Phoenix area. We have a lot of people who make their political predictions off the last thing they saw on Twitter. Right. <laughs> you know, oh, I saw this. And, 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 and they have no – and one of our rules is politics is math. And I know that takes a lot of the fun out of it for some people who want to do politics by their feelings or what they saw two years ago mm -hmm. or the woman they ran into at the grocery store said this. But at some point, you know, we do big boy polling. We're, as you know, when I was a really young man, uh, I helped a, a business that did their, I helped do their statistics for polling. And we had it. We knew our opponent had a ceiling. And this is important in pol polling. You may not have lots of people that love you, but if your opponent can't get over 45, I mean, they just – every and you do a poll where you beat the crap out of yourself. You know, I mean, you know, this this candidate eats puppies. Are you right. – will you – you know, will you vote for the other one? No. At that point, you pretty much know the race is over. When you know you have a ceiling and you can't break through it, I mean, no matter how hard you push. And that was a conversation you and I had – Last summer, it saying was. they have a ceiling, um, we're going to be fine. We're yeah. going to have to work hard. And and I, you know, I, I remember we were speculating on how much the Democrats are going to waste trying to ten. Unseat. We are my best <laughs> math right now is about ten and a quarter million. Ten and a quarter. Wow. Well, God bless and, them. And, and you bring up <laughs> yeah, that's you both bring up a really interesting point, and that is the basics of politics. The, I mean that it, it, you say it comes down to math, but also just comes down to basic blocking and tackling and, and 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 you you seem to understand that better than most in terms of just the retail part of it and 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 getting out there and being present i mean I, i've watched you i haven't been to a lot of your events and and seen you in front of crowds and you're extremely present with people well but, and and that's but that's a rarity i don't know if it's a rarity i look i genuinely love people um you're honest and, and, and there's and there's more and that's a rarity well <laughs> yeah but it gets me in trouble but um i i can't tell you how often i've told people things they don't want to hear they hate me for 48 hours and then they'll call me back and say all right explain this more to me can i give you a really, and, and I don't think I've ever done this on something as recording. So, uh -oh. um, <laughs> well, there's uh, a first for everything. I, I was, I guess. <laughs> might as well be on this show. I was a child, and um, Sean will remember this. I was a child in the legislature when he was still in college. Right. Um, and I, I get elected, I'm 28 years old, and they indict 10% of the legislature. And I'm a little uppity at this time saying, hey, I'm 28 and I represent Scottsdale. I beat a millionaire, you know, I mean, for my seat and this, and just because I was stupid enough to walk door to door for four months. And all of a sudden they're indicting and taking people out. So it's also the fastest way you move up in a body because the next year I was the majority whip. Um, you move up much faster when they were, when they basically put all your competition in jail. Right. Um, <laughs> And, and you have this moment where I spent that summer reading the transcripts from something called ASCAM. Mm -hmm. And I realized the sin that was happening wasn't that these were horrible people. It wasn't really the money. It was vanity. It's they needed desperately to feel important. Mm -hmm. You know, I, give me the shrimp, shrimp concession. But besides that, I'm a really good person. I'm a really good business people. Why don't people take me seriously? It's hubris. 
Um, no, it, it, it's it's even worse than that. Huber's is, is is when you live on your vanity. These it was a level of insecurity, hmm. and I think that was one of the greatest moments of my life, where it sunk in saying, "Ego." It, what do what do lobbyists trade in? They trade in trade in flattery. Hmm. Now, often they're they have a very powerful story. They have you know things you need to know. But when every conversation starts with how tall and good looking you are <laughs> and how that bald spot has healed, um, <laughs> yeah, don't laugh at my bald spot. But we've all got one. It, it, it's so, so I think what happened, and, and this has helped me survive some really rough politics, is d- d- don't believe the flattery is you, but also don't believe the hate is you. It's a business. Yeah. It's a business that screws up your freedom, screws up your future, um, can 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 destroy your children's, and you know, I mean, it, it, it's a dangerous profession, but nevertheless, it's a business, and and that's where we often fail, particularly on the conservative side, mm. is we sometimes become so passionate about understanding and defending the Constitution. Absolutely, you do that, but you need then to understand how. To defend it, and you defend it by winning elections, not having a coffee club where you can put a hundred people in a room and spend three hours talking about who knows more about the Ninth Amendment and why it was drafted the way it was. <laughs> and we do that. Where I find my acquaintances on the left have a much more focused understanding of gaining power. Mm-hmm. They don't sit in the room for three hours and try to prove who's the smartest. They spend three hours walking a neighborhood and finding marginal voters and getting their votes. And so in politics, there's something called political economics, but it's campaign management time. Republicans spend far too much time in the social relationship feeling aspects, and the left treats it as a business because this is what they do for a living. This is how they gain money. This is how they gain, you know, the power is their, their way to they fill their purse. And until we grow up and understand this is a vicious, tough business these days, social media has made it incredibly dark and ugly. The laziness of the press, now that, that's a harsh way to phrase it, because the press doesn't have the resources they used to have. So if you're the reporter and if this were 20 years ago, you're a reporter and you had two or three people that worked for you to help you do your research and now you're someone who's alone and you have to produce so many clicks. Not inches of stories, we used to hear it, but clicks. What do you have to write to get clicks? So so the ecosystem's all screwed up. And my greatest fear is beyond the polarization is the tuning out. What happens when a whole bunch of Arizona Americans say, screw them all. Uh, I'm just tuning out. And so it's a big circle I just threw at you, but from a personal lever, don't ever believe the, the flattery, you know, because the day you leave, everyone forgets who the hell you were. Um, you know, love and cherish the people who liked you before you got elected because they're the only ones that are going to like you when you leave. It's true. It is true. Yeah. <laughs> um, and throw everything you have, your heart and soul at it, and then when you have no more heart and soul to throw, go find a real job. Um, but, but in between there, you know, try to see you know how much of your society you can save. Well, I think that you raise a really good point. I mean, when it comes to the typical liberal Democrat, it's it, the the end is power, right? Because that's where they believe government. They believe in government. So for them, the, having and, the control always, of government, I beg of you to always throw in the word money right after and money that because power and money because that's where the you know they get their money from the government. And for a conservative, the end goal is freedom. And so, if your end goal is freedom. There's just a natural tendency to not 
Yeah. Think of it as a business. Your, moti- your motivation is in the finance. Esoteric, right? Exactly. Yeah, your motivation is in finance. Exactly. Um, but it is it is going to continue to vex Republicans until we get our act together as far as the the working hard to identify and communicate with voters. You know, now, why freedom's important. Now, I need to take you a little bit more, once again, cynical. What happens when the left's financing of their belief system is no longer just government, but I can extort a business because they're fearful of not being woke enough, so they're going to throw us money. I can extort positions at the university by attacking even though sometimes the attacks are absurd, but I know I'm going to get a payoff, whether it be in positions, money, title, promotions. And so how much of what you and I see is this insane cancel woke culture is about destroying those that aren't with you, but also promoting yourself and gaining value from it? Yeah, that's um, a great point the, the, and a scary point. What, you got to understand um, how much of some of the activist groups that exploded this last summer was really for a cause or really was for one hell of a set of checks that got written to them because corporate America was paying functionally extortion. Yeah. And where does that cash all go? Not to good places. It's not getting to the people who... No, the it's not going are for about, the cause. Right? It, it's it's yeah. financing the people who make a lot of noise, but manage the cause. Right. And, well, and, and you always <laughs> find out about it about six months later when the Justice Department wa- walks in and starts making arrests. No. The, see, and it, which, they wh- used to. They yeah. used to on things that turned out to be a brutal scam pack. And that's, that's a whole other side discussion yeah. of it's a Republican problem, much more than the problem on the left, of all the groups that pop up that raise, raise, raise money online on even sometimes television commercials and turns out all the money goes into a consultant's pocket. That's right. Sorry. There's There's good consultants and then there's the parasites. (laughs) There's definitely parasitic. Um, But it turns out the left's version of this is less the scam pack. It's more the scam cause. Um, We believe there's been a wrongdoing here. Give us all a bunch of money to pay ourselves and then we'll give great lip service to how we we tried to help the cause. At some point, how much of the radicalization of modern politics is actually has a dollar sign associated with it? And oh, that's absolutely. something almost no one writes or talks about. But if you actually follow the lineage, it often is always about the money. Yeah. Well, it's just like everything in life. I mean, maybe not everything, but I, I've Pretty much. long <laughs> believed that you want to know something, follow the money. It's just it's well. Weird. I mean, there's a there's the argument that a lot of these groups that you're referring to only show up during elections. Yeah, and then during the previous, you know, the other two years or however many years, eighteen months, you don't hear from them. Well, that's uh, another cynical view, but yeah, and, I I, and, and I, then, I, I think actually happens. it's becoming now year round. So, um, how many companies out there have products? that if you really wanted to, you could throw the, the woke trolls at them. You know, um, and how many of those very companies that know they have products that you could throw you know, the woke army at them? Um, so they pay sort of their versions of reparations. Sure. They do life slip service, they throw monies at causes, and please, I beg of you, don't talk about Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, or some of these things that you look at and go, yeah, maybe that was 100 years ago or whenever that was originally produced, made perfect, but you wouldn't do it today. But if you pay enough lip service and cash out the door, the woke army doesn't come and take you down. Is that now an extortion game? And if it is, um, who's getting the payoff? And it's a very, but... I think I could lay out a very cogent um, line of, you know, almost threats, um, crushing, and then, you know, uh, where the money went. Well, you're already seeing it. When it's the model that that Jesse Jackson 
and the oh, push rain, coalition rainbow, remote rainbow push. push was I all mean, this about is, that. This is yeah. you no, paid, it's you just, paid it's just paid done it and be left alone. Yeah, it's it's done at a you know it, uh, I mean it's it happens much more quickly because of social media. You can do one tweet and get the visceral mob going, whereas Jackson would have to spend you know rallies and protests and get some TV time and you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, it's the same thing. Well, Reverend it's Al. just gotten he does in Reverend Al. Yeah. Okay, now what happens when you've automated it? And yeah. um, this happens at several levels. Um, you want to build a project in certain communities. Um, the city council person for that area will say, hey, you need to go talk to these neighborhood groups. And, you know, and what's the cost of talking to that neighborhood group? Now, it's a legal type of extortion. Um, so the only reason I go, I go down that line is... These are things that are that are basically crushing the ability to have a more egalitarian, healthy, growing society of, of, of opportunity, wealth, fairness. Because keeping us split apart has a profit motive. Sure. Yeah. It's an industry. Yeah. <sighs> Well, and, and, and that's a nice pivot to something you've come under some fire for, and that's HR1. And, and, uh, I don't know and, if I've come on fire for I've been pretty much doing the shooting on that yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know, which is great. And, and some just, people have started shooting back, which is interesting, because I don't under, I mean, from, from our perspective, and we've, we've talked about it a little bit, I mean, the federalization of elections oh, but it might be the most it's so much darker it, than that it, it goes it goes much darker are you ready are you ready to give me seven to one dollar match so i raised two hundred dollars and you're going to give me seven times that of public money to finance money. my yeah. campaign which is so nuts. it's public financing of campaigns um and this drives uh a number of leftist activists nuts but I can prove to you, and I've been willing to do this in a number of public debates in previous years. Take a look at what happened to public funding here in Arizona. When I was a child in the state legislature, I only served two terms and then went away for 14 years. When I was there, um, the legislature was functionally, you know, the Republicans were half conservative, half moderate. The Democrats were half liberal, half moderate. So the moderate center sort of worked. We did public funding of campaigns, and within two election cycles, there were no new moderates. They were gone. And, and the theory is very, very simple. When I walk up to Chris and say, Chris, give me a check, please, you will look at me and say, David, interesting. Can we talk about your politics? Can we talk about the issues I'm facing in my business or my family or my life? Can you – and if I don't give – cogent answers. You don't give me a check. Turns out begging for money is a vetting process. Right. Mm. And if you don't have that type of one-on-one -on -one community vetting process where you got to go around and, you know, I can't tell you the first time I was out begging for money, I sat with a local podiatrist in Scottsdale. I now know more about taking care of feet than I ever wanted to, but it turns out it was a big deal. I had to learn about his profession to beg him for money. And I know this sounds odd, but what happens in a world of online and public funding where I just need my union hall or my, my church or this and that, give me a little bit of money and the government's going to match it. Oh, mo government's going to multiply it by right. in the HR1 seven times. In Arizona, it was multiplied. All of a sudden, you saw the fringes getting financed because they didn't have to go through the vetting process of begging for money. And I remember a few years ago, there was um, former Senator Bradley here in Arizona, who's a big public funding of campaign advocate. And I was one of the speakers taking the other side. So they had like this little debate. And I brought a couple charts showing what had happened in Arizona, but also other city councils around the country that had done this and how they had gone, the middle had been wiped out. And the room hated me for telling them the truth. But I can't tell you how many people at the end came back and said, we had never thought about the fact that when you're out asking for money, 
it is a way that you get vetted. Um, and we wiped it out. And so you see some of what happened here in Arizona. Now we're about to do that to the entire country. It's crazy. Now, you for do- an incumbent, it's great. Please well, understand, yeah. HR1 is the Incumbent Protection Act. Yeah, no question. Yeah, it doesn't, no doesn't, and, and we, I mean, I think there's a general agreement on this table that, that, that money is, is speech. Yeah. And so you're not only, you know, legitimizing a whole new way of running elections, but you're squelching people's own speech. Well, and, you know, and then there's some other dangerous aspects of if you've legalized the, the California model and forced it down the throats of the rest of the country where um, I raise money and a third of that cash now goes to hire people to knock on doors and collect their ballots. Yeah, ballot and there And this is where there is a cultural split. split. People that lean more conservative are, treat that ballot as almost sacred. They have a different relationship with the concept of voting than I believe people on the left. And we can prove this by when you look at the California numbers this last election cycle, there were paid canvassers to collect ba- do ballot harvesting on the Republican side. Paid canvassers to collect ballots harvesting on the left side. Democrats are more comfortable just handing their ballots to a stranger. Yep. It, and it's a cultural thing. It's, it's a view of what voting is and, and do you consider sacred or sort of a business. Right. Um, but Republicans would eventually catch on on how to do it, how to build the relationships. So it might be a short-term comparative advantage for the left. Um, But is that really the model you want to go to is you don't encourage people to vote by your persuasion. You encourage them to vote by having someone standing at their door just saying, just give me the ballot. Yeah, it's... Not a good thing. Yeah, give me the ballot. It doesn't really matter if you filled it out completely. Right. We'll, we'll take and care of that. No, we'll take it, care of that. It, it, and by the way, let me see what your signature looks like so yeah. I can fill that out for you too. Well, and, and look, there are problems out there, even a state like uh, my mother who passed away a decade ago. You know, missed her terribly. Um, she was a character. Oh, God, was she a character. Um, she's still getting ballots at, at her, her former residence. I mean, it's been 10 years. And and you show that to the Democrats saying, you know, do you really support the concept of spending a bunch of money sending ballots to someone who is going to vote Republican? Please understand. She, she was and but you're still sending ballots to someone who passed away a decade ago. And then they yell at you and say, well, that can't really happen. And here's pictures of the ballots. Well, and just how upset they get. Um but the facts are the facts. Yeah. We have really dirty campaign rules. Yeah. There, there's lots of bad addresses. Lots of people have moved. Lots of the, just for the sake of, uh, you know, s- stop filling up mailboxes and killing trees, printing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of things that go nowhere. Right. It's, it's I mean, how often have you done a campaign and realized maybe 20% of the mail you send out went to bad addresses? Well, hopefully we. I mean, that's even after doing even um, after doing the NCOA. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it clearly happens. Um, you, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can spend a lot of money to save money, um, but you're still going to get bad, bad stuff. And it, it's you know, it's the nature of the beast. Um, I know you're on a time crunch. So we want to thank you. We but have it given you anything entertaining? Oh yeah, you are entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it what it gives us is multiple platforms of a launching point to have you back multiple times over the next. Well, what might be years. what might be interesting is if you ever do have me back, um, assuming that. This podcast doesn't immediately get canceled after you broadcast this. <laughs> you know that that, that that point was brought up by somebody else. Yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> that might be a goal of ours. <laughs> I would how actually can we get deep? I would actually how, like how quickly could it happen? I would like to do actually something a little more serious and truly policy based. You know, this was sort of us working through our friendships and our relationship. Um, what's the greatest threat to our society? Apathy. I would say socialism. 
See, and maybe I'm a little too mechanical. Right now, I'm going to say um, over the next 30 years, the debt. Mm-hmm. But the debt is substantially driven by demographics. We are getting old very quickly as a society. Our fertility rates have collapsed. So what do you do to save the country? Because that's not Republican or Democrat. It's math. And a couple of us, mostly me, have been working for years now saying, here's the disruptions you could bring to the economy that save us. So a couple of thought experiments before we end this. The next 30 years, the primary driver of U.S. debt is going to be Medicare. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, it's an earned benefit. You know, the population that we have a social contract, it's earned. But think of that. Over those 30 years, that key driver of U.S. debt being Medicare, I mean, it blows off the charts. 30% of Medicare spending is just going to be diabetes. Pump money into diabetic research. Now, diabetes is complicated. It's autoimmune. It's lifestyle. It's several things. But a breakthrough of being able to rejuvenate pancreatic cells um, or you know, synthetic biology or some of the things, it's, it's time to start being smart. And I can't tell you how many times I go to the floor of the house in the evening and I do the hour speech with lots of charts saying, here's where we're going debt-wise. Here's the destruction of young people. They have no concept what's about to hit them, how different society is going to look just even at, in the next, t- at the end of 10 years from now, we'll be at $42 trillion in debt. Whew. And a lot of that's just healthcare, yeah. you know, just the demographics we got old. Um, young people are about to get their heads handed to them, and they have no idea how different their future lives are going to be because they're going to be paying for this. So, what disruptions can you do to crash the price of healthcare through technology? You know, we see the miracle we've had of success this last year with my telemedicine legislation. There was no way my telemedicine legislation was ever going to go forward until the pandemic hit. Yeah, that's right. I had an army of lobbyists trying to stop it. And you've been working on it for how long? Oh, since the day I got to Congress. Yeah, I've seen seen the charts. And and the fascinating thing is the expansion, being able to access um, uh, telemedicine, the reimbursement stuff goes away the day the pandemic's declared over. We go back to the bad old days. Mm-hmm. And there's already lobby because it changes the economic model, you know, for you don't need the real estate, you don't need the building, you don't need this, you don't need that because you're using technology. It's like why you didn't go to Blockbuster Video this last weekend. Right. You streamed it. Turns out environment, particularly healthcare, there's a number of things out there if we just became really forward leaning we can drag these technology economic disruptions and change that debt curve take care of more people you know a healthier fairer more egalitarian society without crushing the next generation in this debt but it but washington dc has become about stopping the economic disruptions because you have your current business model, do you really want to have to compete with a new technology? Right. And it's that perversity that I think destroys the United States. That is our greatest threat to our society is we need to do the run fast theory of bring the economic disruptions, make businesses compete, make get rid of the oligopolies that is so much of our economy, whether it be social media, airlines, milk. I mean. The fact of the matter is, if you look at the U.S. economy, we've become a country of oligopolies. Yeah. And with that, you lose creativity and the next generation that does things better, faster, healthier, and cheaper. So that, it's, that, it's, it's and I have a whole presentation on just on healthcare, how the technology disruption can crash the price. And understand, I, get, I, I do these presentations, I have people raise their hands and say, well, what about Obamacare? It was a financing bill. Right. The Republican version, uh, alternative, was a financing bill that had nothing to do with changing the cost of health care. Yeah. It only changed who had to pay and who got subsidized. Yeah. We keep associating you know, health care reform in most politicians' mind is just adjusting who has to pay and who gets subsidized. It has nothing to do with changing what you pay. Right. 
And it's the what you pay that's going to destroy us. That's and what's that's where change. the revolution has yeah, to happen. That's what it's changed. Well, yeah, well and, and I mean, just what's interesting about what's, what's happened in the last year with the pandemic, and I've talked about it a little bit, and that is, I, I call it the quickening. It sped up a lot of things, and, and uh, both, both from a health perspective, so uh, how it affected people in, in, in their... Uh, working from home. I mean, yeah. I'm thinking about working from home, the acceptance of telemedicine, That's where it. office buildings, shopping centers, um, regional malls. The and fact of the matter is we also, but the every, one- Everything that was going to happen anyway well, sped up. Now there's one that's stunningly exciting and it's it, you have to read really geeky stuff to find it. We'd been working on the concept of biofoundries for years in my office. The concept of- you have a cancer, we want to set off your body's immune system. So there was this CAR T type therapy, cost about $350,000, you know, took, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks. The RNA vaccines have automated yeah. our ability now to say, here's the virus, here's your body's reaction, grab the body's reaction, do the RNA split, and we may be able to do it in days. That's yeah. amazing. But and, and, and even Tesla's now spending money building something that looks like you know trying to do the automation equipment. What happens if one of the crashes in healthcare is the fact that this pandemic leaped us 10 years in the biofoundry model of medicines where we can cure cancer? Well, yeah, your body, your body can cure the cancers. We can take on viruses. Um, there's something good here, but now you're back to policy. Will we design the tax code, the regulatory code, um, the reimbursement codes in a fashion that we keep moving ourselves forward? Because there's a big push right now to say we want to go back to where we were before the pandemic. Yeah, we can't go And back. slow everything down. Will we, will we create more freedom or not? Yeah. Mm you guys get it. We'll block three hours for the next time. <laughs> for the next time. <laughs> we're, we're, we're on a hard time. Thank you for having me. Take you around. So thank you so much. Great, great, great to be with you.